Well, welcome to the table. We have a really fun uh, podcast episode for you today. And we're in episode two of our racial reconciliation conversation uh, here at Welcome to the Table. And I'm joined by Brian Playstead. Um, Brian, would you say hi? Yes, hi, welcome. And Brian, we have a very special guest with us. Would you introduce your friend, Carl? Sure, I'll, I'll do that, I'd love to. So uh, Carl, I met in uh, 1977. And so that tells you how old we are. Uh, we were both uh, freshmen at the United States Military Academy. And I met Carl in a group that was meeting on um, Sunday nights at one of the chaplain's houses. Uh, and uh, we called it the McDowell Fellowship. And Carl um, was a godly young man then. And uh, I just really appreciated all that he, he represented. And he was a, a great friend. Uh, during that time, and then also over the last 40 years uh, that we've known each other. Um, and so, yeah, Carl is a former uh, field artillery officer and spent a lot of time in the military uh, for 30, what, almost 30 years in the military? So, yeah, so, and um, got to meet, uh, meet his wife before they were even married. So we've known Grace for a long time as well, and his kids, and uh, Carl is a, is a very dear friend. Uh, I would say my best friend. He, he uh, was in our wedding uh, and sang at our wedding, and, uh, and we, at, we attended his wedding as well. So it was a great. Uh, we, we've known each other for a long time. Awesome. Carl, thank you so much for being with us. Hey, would you tell us a little bit of where you're coming from and just some of what you spend your days doing? I would love to, uh, but it, can I first tell you what I think of this amazing guy by the name of Brian Playstead and his lovely wife, Lisa. Um, as he said, we met when we were college freshmen and um, we, in this fellowship, we'd always introduce ourselves every week and we would say what company we were in and we would say we were from, where we were from. And so even though I've never been to the state of New Hampshire, I know Moultonboro, New Hampshire. <laughs> it's, it's, it's burned into my brain and uh, uh, and, but it's wonderful because it, it, it's a reflection of the deep, deep bond that we have that uh, goes back to 1977. Um, they were all, uh, Brian Lee's were instrumental in my courtship. Uh, I met my wife uh, shortly after they arrived in Colorado Springs and I almost blew it. Fortunately, Brian and Lisa gave me some great advice to make sure I didn't. And because of that, we ended up getting married. And my wife attributes uh, our, our successful engagement to them and even nicknamed my oldest son after Brian. <laughs> so that tells you how close we are. That's awesome. So uh, a little bit about myself. So uh, as Brian said, I retired after uh, 30 years in the army, uh, became a contractor, uh, working for Booz Allen Hamilton. Uh, the Army trained me to both do art, artillery and uh, sent me to graduate school to get a nuclear physics degree. Um, and so what I do today mostly is support our nation's uh, defense against weapons of mass destruction. And it's a, it's a fulfilling job and there's enough bad guys in the world to keep us employed. So you feel like you're making a difference each day. Um, in terms of, uh, let's see, I'm married. I have three kids. Um, the oldest is 23, um, nicknamed Brian, and he's actually Carlton the third. Um, I have a son, um, William Nathaniel, um, and uh, I have a, a daughter, Elizabeth Grace, named after her mother. Uh, let's see, I think I'll start by saying I grew up in the military. I lived my entire life in the military. And because of President Truman, I grew up in a fully integrated world. I, and I lived in a fully integrated world and that world made tremendous progress in the area of racial issues, uh, equal opportunity, civil rights. And as a young captain stationed in Korea, I, I'll never forget reading in the military newspaper called uh, Stars and Stripes, 
that a young Lieutenant General Colin Powell had been named National Security Advisor. And I never, I, of course, I didn't know who he was, but I noticed that it said he was the first African American to ever be appointed to that position. And so that was just thrilling and reflected this almost, almost, I call it utopian society that I lived in. Clearly, we had plenty of problems, but relative to the rest of society, we were doing really well. And um, so that's the world I came from. And quite honestly, I think because of that, I'm, I'm really the last person that I ever thought would become interested in championing racial reconciliation because in my world, I felt fully reconciled. And then COVID hit and the kids came home from college and I, had, you know, had been a part of the world and listening to, you know, close to Washington. Uh, so clearly hear, hearing all of the, the rhetoric and knowing that um, things, winds had changed and, and had actually affected my world. And then I discovered that my world was actually not the norm. It was actually, very much the exception, but I didn't know that. And, 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 I, and although there were lots of opportunities for me to, to understand that, I think I, I so held on to this narrative that you know things were getting better that I just kind of compartmentalized everything as a one-off and didn't really, really think it through. Um, but when COVID happened, uh, I thought, okay, well, with all these people getting shot and dying, I need to talk to my kids and have, quote, the talk, which I'd never had because I fully embraced the narrative that I had in my own mind. And um, so they came home and I had to talk with them. And uh, I live in Virginia and one of my sons, uh, let's see, I had one who was a student at Radford University and one at William and Mary. And to get from my house to both, they had to go down 95 through a town called Stafford, just south of where I live. And this massive Confederate flag loomed over I-95. And then while William & Mary was certainly a much more welcoming place, uh, Roanoke, where my other son went to Radford, not so much. And actually I didn't want him to go there for those reasons, um, but, uh, but that's where he went. So, so the, I needed to have the talk. The second thing that happened when we came home for COVID was I said, okay, this is an opportunity to reparent. <laughs> so anything I left off the checklist undone, I get a chance to do now. And so I said, well, let's read through the Bible together and everybody can start wherever they want. And over dinner, we can talk about what the word showed us that day. And so we all embarked through, and I started in Genesis. And perhaps because of the climate, I may have been sensitized to things that I wasn't before, but what I clearly noticed from, from my trek through the Old Testament was the word justice was everywhere. I think I just kind of glossed over it all, in all the other times in the past. And in fact, there's, you know, Micah 6, 8 was a praise course that we used to sing all the time. And you know, to love justice and to do mercy and walk humbly with your God. Um, sang it for 50 years <laughs> and never, never knew that that was actually an indictment. That God was sending them into captivity as punishment because they didn't do this. It was the lack of justice. And that sent me down a path of trying to understand well, how does this all fit together? And that's when I realized that Jeremiah does this beautiful job of explaining that a lack of justice is really a consequence of idolatry setting in and corruption following. And then anything is possible. And one of the first things to go is justice. So, um, then all of a sudden, George Floyd hit. 
And because of COVID, we all got to see it. And I watched it and of course, it broke my heart in a thousand different ways. And um, fortunately, my company felt like, uh, oh, we need to stop the presses. We need to talk about this. We need to see what we can do to make the world better. And that was great. And because of that, my company, we had a town hall and my company uh, gave, particularly our junior folks, our younger people in their 20s and 30s, an opportunity to express what they were feeling. And um, well, during that time, one of our young data scientists asked me to publicly what my experience was like in the military and what my experience was like with Booz Allen. And it was during that time that I, I told them about my wonderful experience, but I also, for the first time, stopped compartmentalizing. And I told them the story of my brother, who as a West Point graduate, first ever to receive an NIH fellowship to Harvard and MIT to get an MD, PhD, was beaten in the streets of Cambridge because of the car that I bought him, which we used to call driving while black. Um, and the entire process that actually led to a court case where they literally were trying to incarcerate him forever. And um, I had to, sh I shared that story and the incredible lengths that God went to ensure that they were not successful, to tell this audience that even though I had this great experience, that it really doesn't matter who you are. If your skin is black, you are subject to the whims of racism in America today. And so with that, I asked the Lord, what can I do? <laughs> you know, I was the beneficiary of this wonderful civil rights movement and um, I have a security clearance so I can't go out and protest and get arrested. So Lord, what, what can I do? And the first thing that came to mind was call your brothers that you fellowshiped with for 40 years and let them know that, that don't, don't write this off as a one-off. And so I started having these conversations and some of them were great. And some were actually quite surprisingly horrible. And, um, and that caught me by surprise. And the process was um, really, really difficult. And I, I, had one, I, I have one dear, dear brother that I met Colorado Springs. Um, I, I, I like to describe him by saying he's a Texan who grew up in a county named after his ancestors. <laughs> so not a transplant, a bona fide Texan. And um, we were having this dialogue and it was, the questions were insulting and he didn't mean anything by it, but it didn't stop it from hurting. And so I finally wrote him a wonderful letter and said, hey, you know, I love you like a brother, but I can't do this anymore. Unfortunately, he wrote me an equally long letter <laughs> saying, I love you too. And I'm not trying to be hurtful. Uh, give me a book to read. So I did. I knew that there was a book out called Just Mercy. And I knew that there was a film. So even though I hadn't read it, <laughs> I felt like it was vetted. So I, I, I recommended it to him. He went out and bought it. And three weeks later, he called me. And when he called, after he got past the weather, his voice cracked. And he said, Carl, I didn't know. And that was really important for me personally, because it helped me to 
to wrap my brain around how is it possible to not know? And I came up with a paradigm, a little meta analogy um, that I, from watching one particular episode of Star Trek. And uh, I'm not a Trekkie, but I did see this episode. And there, it was the, the Enterprise was in space here and the enemy, I don't know what the name of the enemy was, but they were right here. They were occupying the same space, but the enemy ship had a cloaking device. So the Enterprise could not see the enemy sitting right in front of them. And then I said, I get it. This experience is cloaked if you're white in America, because it doesn't happen to you. It literally just doesn't happen to you. And because we all use our own experiences to evaluate and assess data, stories, reports, for plausibility, it is reasonable for white people to think, oh, that couldn't possibly be true, but it doesn't happen to them. And it's equally plausible for minorities to sit there and say, what are you talking about? It happens every day in different ways, in different degrees. And so, so you have this disconnect. And so, um, okay, fast forward. I told my story, or sort of reversed back. I told my story to my company and my boss hears me tell the story and my company seriously wants to do something. So um, they said, hey, Carl, we've got a pro bono project where we're going to help one of our clients in this arena. And you would be great for that. Would you be willing? And I was, again, saying, OK, Lord, what do you, I'm saying yes to everything because I don't know what the answer is. And I'm just saying yes. And so I said, yes, I will be interviewed. So I went to the interview on Zoom and the they asked me to tell the same story. So I told my story. But this time, I think I told you I was kind of exhausted by my one-on-one -on -one conversations. And um, so in a moment of unguardedness, when, they, when I was telling my story, I said, my biggest challenge, the most frustrating conversations are with white evangelicals which I normally would not say in a professional setting, but I did because I wasn't guarded and I was tired. And so afterwards they hired me to do the work. And one of the guys who ran the interview called me afterwards and said, so you're an evangelical. And he said, so am I. And would you mind telling your story to our church? And again, my standard answer is yes. And so, I joined the Zoom call, not fully knowing what to expect. That was a 90 minute session. The first 30 minutes were people gathering and sharing stories between their last meeting and this. Then I was going to be given 30 minutes to kind of tell my story. And then there was 30 minutes afterwards for discussion and Q and A. Well, in those first 30 minutes, Kyle, I was blown away just listening to them. I instantly knew them, even though I'd never seen them before. First and foremost, it was Christ in them. And it touched my heart. Second thing I saw was that these were Washingtonians. And with, with, with all the criticism of the bureaucracy, the one thing I can tell you about public servants is they, they, they're all committed to something bigger than themselves. They're servants and they tend to be well-educated. And the second thing I saw was these Washingtonians were bringing all of their skills to bear on this problem set. And that I found exciting. And so afterwards, um, Afterwards, 
they invited me to come back. And of course, my answer was yes. I didn't know how many times I'd come back, but I said, sure. Because after, after such a wonderful moment, how could I not say yes? And so I came back and back. And about the fourth time, it dawned on me, this is where I should be inviting my friends, not doing it all by myself. And this, um, and so I, initially I thought, well, you know, in the military, we had what we called officers, Christian fellowship studies. And we, Brian and I led many of those. And I immediately thought well, we could do that. <laughs> and then I said, but somebody's got to do all this support work that's very important, the administrative part, the emails, the Zoom links, and all that sort of stuff. I said, I, mean, I don't have time to do that. So I didn't, I didn't uh, just sort of pondered it in my heart. And then the very next week, the leader, whose name is Will, said, hey, Carl, would you be willing to co-lead a group? And I said, yes, but I could never do the administration. <laughs> Immediately wanted to set expectations. But I said, yes, I would love to. And um, so I invited 20 of my classmates from West Point, and Brian was one of them. And he and Lisa joined us. And almost all of them showed up. And about half stayed through the entire 12 weeks. And I will stop there because you probably have at least one or two questions. <laughs> I could go on forever, but it, let me just summarize by saying, um, it has transformed my life. It has created an integration of my faith, my family, my profession at a level I have not enjoyed since I took the uniform off. And like Brian's wonderful words, I mean, just to hear him say, I'm gonna spend 20 years serving God in racial reconciliation, that blows my mind, but I feel the same passion, the same calm. And um, this is where God is, God set this up. I wasn't looking for this. It wasn't my ax to grind. It's, it's the work that God is doing, not just with our groups all around the country. And it's, it's a privilege to be a part of it. Gosh, Carl, there's so many, there's so many things, man, like that are, that are just so neat about that story. And, and just like so clearly how God has been just ahead of you inviting you to kind of take step by step um and then where he takes us when when the answer is yes 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 uh like we, we've talked a little bit about how uh covid has kind of been we've been studying the minor prophets as a church and like covid we talk about covid the minor prophet that it, it it is kind of revealing and showing us some things uh that are broken that aren't working um calling us to repentance calling us to change and some of that can be really painful it can be easy to um, kind of put our head down and maybe look away from. And I totally relate to the feeling of like, God, I, like, how am I supposed to be part of this big thing you're doing? Like, what would my kind of role in that thing look like? Um, and so to, to take a step and say, you know, it, it looks like this today and we'll see where it, we see where it goes tomorrow. Absolutely. The, the groups are special and you, the amazing thing is, is, it's because they're bathed in prayer, first and foremost. Secondly, it's because it's very disciplined. Um, we really strive not to let politics enter the conversation and to stay rooted in the scripture. And then third, it's really about listening and learning. It's people who want to listen and people who want to learn and that creates this amazing environment where you don't get caught up in debates you listen and you process and you hear the person's lived experience and you hear the person's heart and it's kind of like when you're a brand new believer and um you know you want to tell people about jesus but you don't know much about him <laughs> and so what what I remember being told by more mature Christian leaders was you can always tell your story, your own testimony, your own witness of how you came to know Christ. 
and you're always going to be on solid ground by just telling that. And so in the same way, um, when people share what they've been through, it's not, that's, that's safe ground. So let me just say, uh, the, the, uh, just to add to that, um, I, th I call it a model of racial reconciliation model that they, the Lord has led them to. And it's really consists of four parts. The first is the prayer. The second is historical facts and a presentation of those in the, through, through the, a reconstruction video from PBS, as well as a, a seven week um, program called the, the American Lament, which takes you through seven focus areas and understanding how how we got to where we were, the role of the church, and what and how that affects what we experience today. And it's really powerful. And um, about halfway through the American Lament, for those who, are, who really do have open hearts and minds and are willing to listen and learn, about halfway through, people start asking, what can I do? And it's really marvelous to watch that happen. And it happens to different people on different weeks, but when it does happen, uh, it's wonderful to see how the Lord begins to answer that question in, in them as they look at their set of talents, their gifting, and God's calling on their lives. And so, in Carl, you mentioned so that was the sort of the historical piece, so the prayer, the historical piece, and what were the two other uh, pieces huh. that are part yeah. of that? <laughs> Thanks. Listening and learning is is the third, and then the fourth is the is the product of all of that, which is service. Whenever people get frustrated by just pure talk, nothing else. Once you have that desire to want to serve, when you say, "God, what can I do?" You want to be able to serve and, and do something meaningful and constructive, and um, and so the fourth part of that is allowing God to show you opportunities where you can be a part. And um, I, I can, that's such an exciting topic all by itself. Um, and, but I'll save that. We've got tons of stories to tell you of possible service projects, but I'll wait to, till you're ready to talk about that. Yeah, no, I think, and 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 I and really, Carl, like that listening, learning piece for me was, I think, the the sort of key moment. I think when my heart was really changed, because um, you can hear all the facts, but that listening, learning, and listening, especially to other people's experiences, is so is so key, um, and um, especially when, when there are people that, you know, as, as you go through with these groups, you get to know people in a way that I, I think you wouldn't normally otherwise. Uh, and I, I think um, specifically of, of one African-American friend who was in a small group with me, and yet I learned some things from him uh, and about him that I did not know uh, when we were both together in this racial, racial reconciliation group that were uh, you just gave me a whole new window into into him and his experience and and really made me one uh i think understand you know where african americans come from you know as far as our society and our culture but also gave me a great deal of compassion for him as well in in understanding hey you have a more difficult road to walk than i do as a as a white man and you as an African American man, and and that's it's a um, it was just very humbling, and and I and I was like, I, I these groups allow you to be able to get to know each other in a way where I think African Americans are are more open to sharing because people are really interested and in, and wanting to hear and not not wanting to dismiss what what their experience is so. You make a really great point, Brian. When this group originally started, there were no people of color in the group at all. Uh, it, they were part of the Truro Anglican Church. Uh, it, it was an outgrowth of an of a initiative their pastor started. 
um, um, but everybody was white and it was still very powerful, but it pales in comparison to when you bring in that lived experience and people literally listening and not debating, listening and learning. 